Good afternoon, everyone. I know it's been a long day, and that's why we're going to start a very interesting subject, and I'm sure you're going to love it. We have very knowledgeable and esteemed panelists here. And without any further delay, let's talk about what is metaverse. And I'll request Jyoti to kind of start uh, with her little bit of video, which will give you a idea that what are we going to talk about. Thank you, Jyoti. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hello. Yeah, I'm from fashion and uh, retail industry. So, can we play the next slide, please? So, she was, um, Mamta, when she talked to me about uh, Metaverse, she said, like, you guys are already experimenting with Metaverse. We should hear more about it. So, I thought the best thing is to start with our video that, that was our experiment with Metaverse. Could you please play the video? Go back, please. So, sorry guys, it, it worked just, just two minutes back when I tested it and it's, it's not working now. I don't know what's happening with the console now. Can I, can I just play the video? Yeah. Yeah. So while, while uh, Jyoti is trying to play the video, let me ask uh, Lakshmi, who is a, another very vast, knowledgeable uh, in-house counsel from Samsung, you have also created uh, extended reality platform. And uh, from a mobile telecom industry, how intrinsically would you say that Metaverse and IP are interlinked? Thank you, Mamta. That's a good question. Are you hear me there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the words from the telecom industry, extension or extended reality, let me just tell in simple words what Metaverse is all about because we are yet to see what Jyoti has for us in the video. Metaverse, I would say, it's a converged platform. What is the convergence? We have a real world. Real world has God's creations and man-made creations. There is a virtual world. Everything is man-made plus AI made, artificial intelligence made. I would say since I come from telecom industry, I would say there is also a third world attached to it, that's the wireless world. In real world, objects form are real. In virtual world, it's in digital form. In the wireless world, they are all in signal and data packet form. That's all. Wireless world connects the real world and the virtual world. How it is interlinked with IP? We all know IP itself is a convergence of Market, technology, as well as legal. Same way, there are three aspects to understand what is the link of metaverse with IP. We knew mobile phone is a convergence, converged device or convergence of computers. It's a converged computer. With convergence of just computer alone, you, you can imagine the magnitude of innovation that's happening there and the technology opportunity available. If metaverse is a convergence of three different worlds, imagine telecom alone has 3G, 4G, 5G, 6G. Imagine all the three worlds in converged form, how much technology opportunities will be there. That's the first aspect of the linkage with IP, technology opportunity. The second one is market opportunity. I think there is a Gartner report which says from 2026, 2026 is just two years down the line. Every person will spend at least one hour in the metaverse. That's the market opportunity. Even today when youngsters were interviewed in the United States, people said almost 50% of the people, youngsters, they socialize via computer, not in person. 40% of them, 
socialized by our computer games. Imagine the market opportunity available. Of course, there is an IP potential attached there. Where there is ambiguity is all about the legality. The man-made objects in the metaverse could be avatar. We know in IP, a person could be a natural person. How would you call an avatar as? Is he a natural person or entity or what it is? That ambiguity still persists. You know, if we ask AI to rewrite a paragraph, two times if you ask it to rewrite, two times it will give two different results. The person who is giving command to AI does not have full control. What result will come will be surprising. So the actions carried out by avatar or AI has no proper control on the, from the user. So his actions, what is the legality involved? What, whether it is an offense or a crime, or since there is no control, who really caused it? Those kind of questions still exist. So that's pretty much a market, technology and legality, I would say, is the IP linkage with the existing metaverse. In the interest of time, I leave it to the other panelists. Thank you, Lakshmi, for setting the tone, and I totally agree with you that it's a huge potential market available to all, and all big brand owners are trying to get into the area, at least for advertising their brands. So, right from Nestle to, of course, uh, Aditya Birla, and of course. So, coming back to you, Jay, uh, as a leading tech innovator, what kind of experience you have in Metaverse world? And what is the IP strategy which you have adopted for protecting and enforcing your brands? Thank you. That's a, <clears throat> um, I can say it can be answered in a very legalistic way and also a very, very generic way. So I, let me look at an example. Um, for the media industry, I think uh, uh, this can also comment on this. Um, uh, back in the 70s, uh, the producers of movies used to assign their rights in the movies lock, stock, and barrel, or the uh, or the complete assignment to to companies or let's say anybody. And then later, the the technology would transform into a different type of let's say an audio in a movie. It gets released on an LP, it gets released on a cassette, cassette and then on a CD, and then on uh, streaming platforms. Okay. And then you have images from the movies uh, being used in, in a particular way. Uh, like an avatar is created out of Amitabh Bachchan or, or some other celebrity like that. Then you technically, as, an, as a person who has licensed this content, do not have any control over it. I'm just giving an example. I'm not trying to get into the specifics of know how it would actually pan out to be. Now, as a producer who had this image with me, uh, I do not have any control over how it will be used 30 years later when the technology develops into multiple platforms or multiple types of diffusion. Uh, so therefore, the kind of use, I don't want to transgress into your area, but I'm just, I'm just trying to be, uh, you know, it's trying to give an example, so I don't get much into that. But there are, uh, these are the kind of things uh, that would happen in the, in the the space and from from my perspective from you know, I've worked in uh, various industries but you know in the current industry where I'm involved in the manufacture of aircraft engines uh, I would talk about Boeing using a certain technology to visualize certain certain pattern of let like, inspection of a, of a firing pattern or uh, a usual maintenance of an engine component how they, they want to visualize they would use a VR uh, and then, 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 then use that particular thing to arrive at a particular conclusion. So, if you look at the kind of strategy that company employs, you look at Apple has filed an application that I lead in terms of understanding <coughs> a, a consumer's or a customer's behavior pattern while there is activity going on, depending on the mood of the person, depending on the, how the person is actually responding on the platform, they would and this, they would they use a technology to understand the, understand the customer. Similarly, Nike has filed an you know, application for a particular footwear, depending upon how, how the customer is actually behaving on the platform. So uh, companies are certainly, just to answer your question straight away, companies are thinking, whether it's Nike, Apple, or Nietzsche, they are thinking of customer behavior being used as a, uh, as, as a method to arrive at a particular IP strategy, if I can answer it in a very generic way. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. That's very informative. Okay. 
ESCSP system. So back to Lakshmi for uh, some video which will show that how Aditya Birla has exploited metaverse for the present. Over the night, alive and bright, chasing all shadows. Being part of the Van Heusen Metaplay experience was actually great. This was our first Metaverse experience where we could connect with our fans. I really like that our characters were styled by some of the best in class designers of Van Heusen. And the fact that you can buy all of these apparels in the offline stores is even more amazing. This was really different from all other concerts. It had some really cool dreamy visual effects which made our game look so fantastic. Our fans looked like they had such a blast to me. They were trying out different costumes with the Van Heusen range. And they were jumping, toggling, dancing along. When the concert was going on, it was a great sight. So that was uh, our Van Houston brand in Metaverse World. So what we did was we had a concert and then the customers were allowed to close the avatars with the products, the digital products that we gave them. And you see that because it's the making of this video, but it was a live concert and then live in February. So could you please go to the next slide? So my co-panelists have already spoke about metaverse, but what is a metaverse is something that, again, in the context of fashion industry. Can you please play, play this one? Sorry, sorry for keeping you waiting and but again we have to go back to the definition of metaverse. What exactly is it? Well, everybody knows you all see that it's an immersive experience that you know metaverse provides you. It's a 3D virtual world experience. And we must not remember that metaverse is just not one technology. It is a bundle of technologies. Basically, you are using you know, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, and then of course blockchain, and many other technologies here to give the you know immersive, you know, the immersive experience to people. So it can be gaming, it you can shop, you can uh, meet people in metaverse world. So this is the metaverse today. This is what the world is talking about, and the old world is going back about it. But if you actually look at the technical definition of metaverse, can you go to the next slide, please? So very important thing that I very quickly come from this book, Matthew Paul, who is the CEO of Epion, and he is an expert in this area. He says, technical definition of metaverse, a massively scaled and interoperable network of real time rendered 3D virtual worlds that can be experienced synchronously and persistently by an effectively unlimited number of users with an individual sense of presence and with continuity of data such as identity, history, entitlements, objects, communications, and payments. You can see that all of this goes to show that we are not ready yet. There is a lot that needs to happen in the world. But probably, it, it, you know, Matthew says that it might take another decade for us to say whether this is right. But yes, it's a work in progress. And why I put this definition is it's very, very important for us to understand all of this, whether it is you know, whether it is computing to powers or whether it is you know development of hardware industry, you know, because you need the glasses, you need to, you know, you have to react with the objects with the with you know going to the real world, the virtual world, and the physical world has to be blurred. So to that extent, the technology has to perfect itself. Look, there will be many other technologies. So we are really far off yet. 
metaverse is there already we are using it in a very limited capacity i should say so go to the next slide please so i would say in our response to a question how a fashion industry can make use of that as i said like you know it's a business model we might even choose to have virtual goods virtual goods are not the same as the digital goods because digital goods when i was talking about the amazon basically you you know, you have a digital good but you can also go and buy you know at the good or so but here we are talking about virtual goods virtual goods do not necessarily you know they are not available physically they are available only in the metaverse world so that could be a business model brand positioning you could create your exclusive brand metaverse like the gucci the gucci garden they created their own metaverse world so that you know that's how they position their brand uh, from you know for their luxury or its luxury brand and they make the customers of course it in can and has bottom line digital twins are used to reduce manufacturing cost ads in video games or metaverse platforms and of course brand associations like of course percy will also say that you know because all the video gaming companies movies all of these concerts like just as shown you these are all the areas where you know metaverse really could be used for the fashion and you know the retail industry next slide please now just to give you some kind of numbers you can see that you know whether it was a nike is nike land metaverse or whether it was gucci garden they were all you know they were all uh, launched on roblox platform just to see that according to vogue fashion there are an estimated 3.4 billion gamers worldwide and 27% of whom are between 21 and 30 and this is the kind of you know people we are talking about like all of these video gamers definitely they are there in the metaverse and these are the people who like not only just to play games they would also like to you know adorn all these avatars with various products like fashion apparels and you know even cosmetics they can use their you know there are certain skin uh, treatments to be given to their avatars and stuff like that so all of that could be made a little bit of this so next slide please again in the interest of time i was just talking about gucci garden so that you know just you know just to tell you that when they made this experience so they had a limited 17 million visitors visiting roblox you know this platform gucci garden You can you can you can see the craze for it. The next slide, please. And Nike, Nike, you know, there was this company called Army of Nike. They were digital collectibles company. They sold about you know three million worth of virtual sneakers in less than five minutes of their launch, and they were acquired by Nike. That is like this. And Nike Land, Nike then it had its own metaverse called Nike. It had its own metaverse called Nike Land or Roblox platform again. They say like almost like this. I think the number has crossed already. It's like counting more than so many visitors have already been there, and it's just not about wearing clothes. It's like they can do multiple things. They can play games. They can win. They can, you know, they do basically they can become brand ambassadors in various platforms, in various uh, you know activities of Nike World. So this is how the brands are you know utilizing metaverse. Next slide, please. And of course, this is a, a new platform that's emerging, newer. It's a four-year-old gen. Next one, please. So, metaverse market, how big is it? I'm just talking about, you can say, just the Asia Pacific metaverse market today. We stand at about 13.5 billion, and you know where are we getting to? 2030 is expected to be US 1.3 billion dollars industry just in Asia Pacific region. So that's the type of metaverse world we are talking about. Then, however, since there is so much to be done and it's all a work in progress, please go to the next slide. I would only say metaverse is evolving, possibilities are endless, and I would like to just, for now, end my you know short talk with this quote of next next slide, please, of what Steve Jobs said way back in 2008. It's very relevant today also because 2007 when they launched their first iPhone. Steve Jobs said it's the most revolutionary product that the world has ever seen. Within 10 months of that, when they came up with the App Store, you know what he said to Wall Street Journal: "I would not trust any of our predictions because reality has so far exceeded them by such a great degree that we have been reduced to spectators just like you." Watching this amazing phenomenon, so I would only say this applies even to metaverse today. 
video, you don't know how it's going to really pan out. But yes, it has immense possibilities. Can you talk more about it? Then to Adia Perison. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jyoti. That was uh, fascinating indeed. And those numbers are really indicate that how important this market is. How many of you have seen Bare Mia, Choti Mia, the Hindi blockbuster movie? Please raise your hands. So yes, uh, so quite uh, quite a few. So you will know that uh, one entity, Puja Entertainment, they bought a land in the metaverse and they call it Puja Verse and they actually made the movie in a metaverse land and now they are monetizing it. So it's not only the content which you will create is going to be monetized, but also the content which has already been created that can also is that also gives an opportunity for the content creator uh, to monetize in a different world altogether. Now coming back to you, Persis, what is the importance of IP in content curation space, and how do you commercialize it? Uh, thanks, Mamta, for the question. I think enough has been spoken about the uh, metaverse. And uh, first and foremost, uh, for us, uh, when we look at the content creation industry, we are actually still living in the real world. Uh, taking my films on Metaverse uh, might take uh, some time, but we are, uh, we are also trying to create uh, virtual cinemas, uh, live shows, concerts. And uh, how do I protect my IP? Of course, uh, enter into amazing number of uh, agreements on each project because I make sure that uh, Every piece of work for me uh, when I make films or web series, uh, it's like uh, right from the literary work, audiovisual work, songs, dance, everything is uh, copyrightable. So of course I secure my IP. Uh, I make sure that it is uh, stationed at one place, uh, be it a studio or a producer. And then when it comes to commercialization, as uh, Jay said that earlier it used to be, is that producer used to blindly assign everything to uh, one person, but nowadays uh, everybody's become smart. So we know how to dissect uh, each uh, penny of the revenue which comes from different different uh, forms of rights and in different forms uh, in, from different parts of the world. Like uh, India never had a chance to you know monetize the background music. For a film, a background music is the most important uh, aspect. We monetize songs, but we couldn't uh, monetize uh, the BGM. Of hand, uh, you know, we are also starting up. And uh, we are requesting uh, many of our uh, operate agencies to let us monetize the BGM as well. Uh, so that safeguards our uh, IP interest and how do I monetize it? Yes, we open in theatres, OTT, satellite. And uh, very soon we are looking at to even, uh, as uh, Mamta said, that yeah, Google Entertainment has uh, started its work on the, on the metaverse. But uh, that metaverse window will be another uh, window where we'll uh, look at exploiting and making money from it, but once only it is established. Because as of now, uh, as Jyoti also said, it's still in the making. Uh, for us, uh, uh, we don't have very uh, structured based uh, form of business. Uh, that's why uh, to take anything on Metaverse, uh, first we make sure that everything is in place, even the laws, even the paperwork. And even to make, you know, explain to these actors that, you know, your NFT needs to be assigned to us because now offhand I'm getting queries uh, that uh, the actor will do work on a work made for higher basis, but the NFT created as for that particular character will be taken back by the actor. That means already in the minds of the, these actors, writers, musicians, it is already started evolving that this piece of work they will be able to exploit on their independent basis on metaverse through NFT on blockchain, but. Uh, we as lawyers, uh, you know, have to bridge the gap between the producer and the actor, and make sure that the NFT of that particular ca character, which is actually created by the director, is being assigned to the producer because that is metaverse will be a window where that NFT can form a part of, say, an apparel, or it can form a part of a game, or uh, you know, open shows uh, on metaverse, or be a part of anything. But uh, but we don't want that uh, that revenue going back to the actor because the actor has already got paid. Uh, or the talent rendering services is already got paid for, the, uh, for whatever the work is being done. But since the producer is spending money, uh, we make sure that the NFT gets uh, assigned uh, to the studio only. So that is the latest thing which is happening. But uh, uh, we'll see how we cross the bridge. But, but yeah, international studios have already started uh, 
you know, uh, making their uh, venture into metaverse and already launching movies, already launching their animation characters uh, and making sure that people at least uh, go there and watch uh, through the virtual reality. And when I do films, uh, I uh, like when I do big ticket films also, uh, eventually yes, we would definitely like to make that particular uh, real film into the metaverse film and even, uh, you know, recoup our money uh, which is invested in the real film from the digital assets, but uh, we should have some laws in place, is what I feel. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, uh, my next question you to Lakshmi that uh, you come from a mobile industry, which is kind of a household thing, everybody uses it. And uh, gaming is one aspect which is very closely related to metaverse. So, what is the trend you, you are saying in terms of licensing or in terms of marketing your product? What is that trend which you believe is setting up right to at least accept that metaverse is going to be the future? Uh, I am an innovation professional. So I better talk in terms of innovation and what's going on. There are three types of experience that people can gain in metaverse. One is non-immersive experience. The immersion is immersion into the virtual world and slowly forgetting the real world. Non-immersive experience means we can consider playing video games. Currently, it's already there. Although some amount of metaverse content is there, it is still called non-immersive only. User's presence is still there in the real world, he keeps playing the video game. There is another category of experience called semi-immersive. Even in HAL, in this on aerospace limited, you can, there are flight uh, simulators. You will feel like you are flying, but you are still in the real world, you know half of your mind is in the real world, the half is in the virtual world. That's an example of semi-immersive. The real metaverse and innovation market opportunity, what we all are seeing today, will be in fully immersive experience. That means, while into the metaverse, the user will forget his real world. He will fully, be deeply immersed into the virtual world. What kind of innovations are possible there? What is the emerging trend? One point is, we know that there is a real world. Already real world is getting smarter and smarter with IoT and so many things getting developed. One trend is, what kind of data we can supply from real world into the virtual world, whether and that data can create a new business opportunity or a service opportunity. That's where one kind of innovation trend, technology trend is emerging. Another one is into the virtual world itself. Everything is three-dimensional. It is easy to imagine and we can see the real world. But can we really make a virtual world? First of all, you need to do enhancement of the images, complete 3D rendering. Even audio should be 3D. Three-dimensional acoustics will be there. And space, space means who knows which object where to be placed. So many things have to be controlled. All those are currently evolving. That's another trend that is happening. We know the form factor of the devices are either glass or you need a headgear to wear. There is no touch. Mobile means you can easily touch. How will you operate that? We have to touch our eyes again or the glass. It may not be, it will be, it cannot be proper. So, hand tracking, eye tracking, gaze, gaze. So many new ways of interacting with the devices are evolving. Even to understand better, I will give you one or two small, small examples. Connecting the metaverse to the existing devices is what is happening. Imagine you are running for 10 minutes in a treadmill. If it is a metaverse enabled treadmill, as soon as you get into the treadmill and start running, you can select in the metaverse that please uh, uh, give me an experience of running in New York City. So you just press a button, you will get a feeling that you are already inside New York and you are already running in the streets of New York and along with several other people from New York, you are also forming a group and running. What is not possible, this metaverse can make it possible. That feeling it will give, that is immersive experience. Raven has made glasses, like just have a wear the glass, and then whatever you see in the real world, directly you can stream it into your Facebook account. That's the basic version of it. So as the immersive experience becomes bigger and bigger, People are likely to even forget the real world and spend most of their time in the virtual world. That's the innovation. Thank you. That's very interesting. We are moving. We can now live our dream world, which uh, we see. 
Now coming back to uh, Jyoti, that uh, how do you see that with so much of complexities of technicalities, which an innovation going on, what is the IP strategy for protection as well as enforcement, which as a, a giant in the industry you would uh, you have taken and you would recommend that one should uh, look into it. Yeah, hi. So, as I, I just was explaining, uh, Metaverse uh, was, if you're talking about today, you can see Nike's Nike Land, Gucci Garden, like, you know, somebody else's. See, you, you can see that all of these are being uh, launched on, you know, you know, a third party platform. Maybe it could be, you know, Roblox or Central Land, you know, whatever. So you just you are you are dependent on somebody else to develop your you know infrastructure wherever you are operating. So as of today, we are not you know we are not ready for an interoperable metaverse universe. What he was saying is like you are a user in one platform, then you exit and you get into another seamlessly. But that's not happening. It's it's going to happen sometime little later, it's all work in progress as I told you. But now if you are looking at today how we are going to strategize your IPs, well, if we are having our own IP, you know, like, sorry, uh, your own metaverse, so the question comes of how are we going to, you know, like, let the users, you know, because metaverse is all about giving users a lot of freedom to choose their, you know, the Apple accessories and, you know, or play it the way they want and, and you know, like, do a lot of activities. So when it comes to, you know, us at this point in time, well, you, you we have to really look at whether, you know, if you are going into this virtual world and are we, you know, registering our, you know, trademarks because here most, most often in the context of fashion world it's about trademarks. The copyrights, I wouldn't say much because it's, it's all created by the platform so we don't have much to do there. But then trademarks is what like you know probably class nine where you know down as a downloadable software today as it stands and at class nine you could register. The situation of trademarks is one, but I think what's also important is having a robust policy strategy to see what's happening in these metaverse worlds. You must all you must all know that this is just this is not one. Every one you know like can come up with one metaverse world till we reach a stage where they become interoperable. So you would know that there are so many places like we I don't see it any different today also because today we have to you know have a vigilance agency in Delhi, in Mumbai, in all other places, in, in malls, in wherever it is. You know we just have to go around seeing whether people are you know infringing our you know uh, IPs. You know basically it's trademark and copyrights. So it's 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 just akin to that as of today because metaverse is not reached the place where we are actually it is supposed to be. And then, of course, infringement again, when it comes to infringement, I think things are not changed much. It's just the same. We would have to figure out who is that, but it only now becomes complicated because, you know, how are you going to, you know, enforce them? Like, of course, there was one recent judgment of, I think, Swami Ramani says in Delhi High Court where it said that, you know, you can apply long arm jurisdiction. So, you know, basically you can, if, if it was done here, it was developed here for Indian users, so you could actually give a little global injunction. You could ask them to remove the, you know, the infringing material from the global sites also. Some things like that, you know, it will remain the same. But then, going forward, it's going to be really challenging. It's we we really don't know how to enforce. Even today, it's the same thing. Even minus metaverse, we are still in the same boat because when we when we have people from different countries and we are not able to establish the identity. Very difficult to have enforcement actions against them, even today, and better was just gone. Uh, thank you, that answers the question. Uh, so, uh, Vaibo had given the, uh, in February 2023, that all digital goods will fall within class nine. So, have you taken the steps to kind of an additional protection for your brands, which you already may have in 25, or maybe in 35 or nine, but have you specifically taken for digital goods? Do you do and uh, Swami Ramdev, I was one of the counsels, so I just wanted to tell you it's an appeal, it's sub I don't want to comment. But yes, uh, cross jurisdictional is one of the issues. So my question goes to Jay that uh, uh, IP rights are territorial in nature, and metaverse by its very own nature is 
extraterritorial because the more expandation it's, it is, you know, uh, the more reach out it is, and uh, it can be it can be accessed from anywhere, and because it's on internet, it's an it's a virtual internet world. Uh, how do you see what kind of challenges in enforcement uh, you have experienced, or what are your comments on that? That what is the conflict between the territoriality of the IP rights and the extraterritoriality nature of the metaverse? So thank you. Um, let me take one old case that uh, uh, everyone knows probably: Anatomy versus Whirlpool. Uh, the question was, was Whirlpool in India, before that case was filed basically, uh, Whirlpool was trying to claim that they had a transporter, a cross-border reputation, and therefore any use of that trademark can be stopped uh, by filing a case in India. And uh, imagine that situation, now you do not have, uh, no, just, just before that comment, I would like to recall one statement by one of the universities in, universities in Amsterdam which said, real world laws are not enough for the virtual world and that stands true even today. Now, we associate enforcement or a particular provision against an act which is committed within a territory, within the confines of a particular law in, a, in that territory. Now, if the action of the person in the virtual world is take, going beyond a jurisdiction, the geographical jurisdiction of a place, then you have fundamental challenges in terms of uh, enforcing a particular action. And then I do not know if there is any method by which we can arrive at a solution right now, because uh, you just mentioned about a universal injunction. I mean, not, a, not just a John Doe kind of a mechanism, but you know, a universal injunction. I, I'm, I'm sure people are having trouble in terms of enforcing action against multiple domain names, etc. I don't want to dive this into that, but I'm saying, in terms of jurisdiction, you are already seeing trouble in terms of uh, having infringing materials on multiple domain extensions or uh, uh, or real world laws not being effective in terms of enforcing uh, a certain judgment. Uh, except for certain cases, like you, you have a convention where you know, a lot of things can be done. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, going back to the question, yes, there are challenges, and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, enforcing a certain uh, action against a person who's out of the jurisdiction is going to be tough unless we are, unless we are uh, the legislators are, legislators are thinking about how to apply this. And it's not going to be one man action, it is going to be a global action. Thank you, Jay. That's informative. I'll quickly go to Versus, uh, and I'll ask that in the content creation industry, how do you safeguard that it is not infringed or it is it is it is actually the benefit is going to the owner and not being compromised by the infringers? What steps do you recommend and what steps you have taken so far? So uh, I wouldn't talk in metaverse. Uh, I will talk in the real world. Uh, so earlier there used to be a lot of uh, piracy happening about uh, the films and the web series. But uh, offhand, uh, there are uh, agencies which work across India, and uh, we before releasing the movie, like seven days before we enter into an agreement with these agencies, and we tell them that uh, keep a tab across the world. Uh, whoever is uh, downloading the pirated version, uh, please inform us and give us a data sheet. So then, immediately uh, they have some tie up with an respective country, and they inform them. And that's how then the uh, pirated content is being uh, plucked out. But, uh, but you know, uh, I feel that uh, over the years, uh, because of the OTT in place, and uh, the piracy has really gone down, and uh, the law is also taking uh, strict actions against the infringers. Apart from that, uh, when we do trademark and when we do, uh, when we come up with uh, some wacky titles of the films, uh, we definitely, I definitely make sure that it is, uh, you know, uh, fallen under certain classes of trademark because we also do merchandise, we do animation, we also download uh, this advertise. Uh, for that we enter into a trademark so that then further there is no uh, copying of that particular title. And if that title is used uh, in another movie or if a particular character uh, is also represented in a certain ad, uh, that particular person has to come back to us to take an NOC, otherwise we will take an action against that person uh, who has played that particular character in that particular advertisement as well. 
uh, with that particular name because that particular name that character has been uh, given by the uh, by the studio by the producer it is not the uh, actor's intelligence so the actor has to come back to us saying that uh, look i am playing the particular character uh, please give me an noc uh, any form of uh, work copyrighted work which is uh, used without permission uh, definitely uh, we send notices immediately sees and receives notice and uh, obviously we don't go to courts that much <laughs> but uh, yeah it's a phone call away that uh, you know please uh, please put it down uh, and in good faith uh, everybody helps each other because it's a, we all we come from very small uh, i always say it's like a family run uh, business film industry is like a family run business so we just pull it down and uh, we help each other we never walk upon somebody's psyche because that is created with a lot of uh, sweat and money yeah thank you for that but uh, lakshmi can you just uh, also suggest that uh, your ideas on there should there be any requirement of compliance or regulatory framework like any other industry see metaverse is going to grow very big Uh, at least the K KYC requirement that you know before you are uploading because how do you trace back uh, if the business is so big the infringement is also going to be big so do, what what would be your your recommendation that uh, the requirement or compliance is be put in place I think Persis mentioned help each other with pulling out that's the best strategy it's possible in the KYC requirement I would say there is already digital ID. Which uh, the regulators can find out whose avatar it is, who is the person behind uh, creating the campaign. That's already there. Technology is taken care of. But where and when it should be used, that is one point. We think that uh, metaverse mostly it is used for transactions, like money transactions or cryptocurrency transactions. Beyond that, there are applications for metaverse. A conference happening in metaverse. Who is the real person who is speaking? How do we know? Same way, elections can happen in metaverse. Whose vote is that? How do we know? And then uh, decision making, group discussions happen in metaverse. Who's who is the person who decided? How do we know? If they, in certain areas, know your customer can be fully stripped, completely revealing the identity in uh, transaction cases. But in uh, applications where there is no transaction. I think now software is emerging where the user need not fully reveal his identity. Still, he can prove that he is the user. Don't we sometimes when we forget the password? Don't we say what is your mother's maiden name? What is your pet name? Partially reveal, and then still you will get to know who is the person uh, to get access. That is um, something people can consider whether to fully take away the privacy of the person, completely know the identity. Or there is a zero knowledge through technology. That's what is being used to partially reveal the user, but still know your uh, customer gets scammed. Beyond all this, these are all after an event has occurred. We try to find out who is the user. Uh, best thing is to prevent them. Now generating AI is working. Today morning also we get a lot of people say, even before somebody is going to commit an offense, generating AI can find out that an offense is going to happen. Which is currently not there in this world. Those are the innovations that can really be encouraged to as a preventive measure. For example, blockchain technology. When somebody should get an access? If I have to go into office, first I should swipe my ID card at the entrance, then go and open my laptop. If we use blockchain technology for security purposes, and if I skip ID card swiping in the entrance. If the platform comes to know that I am directly opening my laptop from my first floor, then something wrong has happened. So those kind of access technologies, newer platforms, are the best way to overcome this kind of invasion of privacy or any offences committed in metaverse platform. So revealing identity is a challenge. Partial way or using technology to overcome the privacy issue is the best way in my view. Yeah, thank you. That's good to know that anonymity can be cracked, but at the same time, as you rightly raised, that the data protection and privacy can be another challenge. But coming back to you, Lakshmi, just one last question. Coming back to you, Lakshmi, that do you think that there is a sufficient current legal system where we can address all the issues uh, with the protection and enforcement, and you know, 
uh, development, also the environment for you know giving sufficient opportunity to the uh, small scale industries and mid scale industries to get into and exploit this humongous market, you know, the trillion dollar market. Uh, what what are your thoughts on that? Oh, well, I think you know before we even touch ideas, what's more important is to you know have you know voluntary standards for this metaverse world because that have happened when it becomes interoperable. Like if you if you even recollect in Internet Engineering Task Force like IEP of which was you know US federal agency which really steered the industry towards agreeing on voluntary standards for internet and today's internet is what it is because of those standards you know agreed voluntary standards so something like that is very important for even for the you know the government to come up you know at least the governments to come up with these kind of universally accepted acceptable standards that is one thing. And of course, the governments also should look at how to unbundle the rights of these, you know, the public service providers. If you think of today, everything is in the hands of these developers. But at the same time, not to give innovation because we still have to give them enough liberty to develop and monetize their, uh, you know, rights. These, and of course, alongside, not to forget, you know, legalizing those kind of things, and then you know, the you know, also have to, have to look at. Uh, smart contracts, legalizing them. All of these things are important to first ensure that the metaverse works really seamlessly. And then comes your IP rights. Only when everything you know is, is all done, like the platform is all there, then you will think of, oh, this is my creation, this is your creation. Okay, I am creative, you are creative, and all of that. But if you are all influenced and you will have created everything, then where are you from talking about like, what kind of standards of lifestyle are you talking about? It's that what I would like to say. I think there's a lot to do. Even for the technology itself, the technology governance has got to be done even before we touch on it. That's, that's my take on this. You've summarized very well. We are running short of time. She's smiling. So thank you all. It's been really wonderful.